great is thy faithfulness, O oh God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. You never change your compassion. Everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. So good to see everyone in the house of the Lord on this Wednesday evening. I wonder if we could stand all over this place. We just had an incredible time together in revival this past weekend. Many filled with the Holy Ghost. I believe four was the final count, four or five, filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. One baptized in Jesus' name, several healings. Why don't we just give God thanks? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And tonight we're celebrating the continuation of what God began last weekend. Amen. I wonder if anybody came with their minds made up. We're still in revival. Amen. I wonder if we could go before the Lord for this service uh, and ask that he have his way in this place tonight. Uh, can you lift your voices all across this sanctuary right now? God, we love you. We thank you, Lord, uh, for this time together. We pray, Lord, that you would minister, uh, that you would touch. God, have your way in this place. Uh, Lord, prepare us, Lord, for what you would have us to receive in this place. Uh, in the name of Jesus, uh, we pray. I want 
wonder if we could just clap our hands to him today. Uh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The angels are about his throne saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who is, amen, and who is to come, the Almighty. That's what the angels are saying in heaven around the throne of God. But I believe tonight at Cornerstone Tabernacle, Popper Bluff, Missouri, there's some people that are letting out a holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Hallelujah. We've got a praise for him too, angels. Hallelujah. We've got a praise for him too. Hallelujah. He is the Almighty. Hallelujah. He's the mighty God. The everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Amen. And He is, just kind of point to yourself and say, He's my God. He's my God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can be seated. Ushers, get ready. I'll make a couple of announcements while they're coming. And we're going to not take an offering. We're going to give an offering. We're not going to take one, but we're going to give one to the Lord. But a couple of announcements I'll make before we give. Single Adult Ministries Bowling at Dexter on 212. And then Echo Chocolate Covered Strawberry Fundraiser. Echo, see me after service. <laughs> I like chocolate-covered strawberries. And I'll make sure that my wife buys me some for Valentine's Day. Maybe the other way around. Amen. But we're going to give to the Lord tonight. Amen. His goodness. How many has God been good to you? Amen. Bishop Parkey used to say it like this. God's been good to everybody, but he spoils me. And I tell you what, I feel like I've been spoiled by the Lord Jesus Christ and His goodness, His favor, His blessings upon our, my, my life individually. Amen. Let's lift a hand to Him and let's thank Him as we give. Amen. To God's kingdom. Lord, we love you tonight. So thankful for you. Thankful that we can give, Lord, tonight. Out of the abundance of our hearts, we give to you in Jesus' name. God bless you as you give tonight for His kingdom.
Magnify the Lord together all across this house. Oh, you're great, God. Spend just another moment together in the presence of the Lord. Why don't we just close our eyes and lift up our hands to Him across this house? Let Him wash our minds of clutter, our heart of things that have hold us holding us back and let's lift up the name of Jesus. Let's shout that name before we're seated. Jesus, Jesus, we adore you. Jesus, we adore your name. Hallelujah. And everybody said in Jesus' name. Welcome someone to the house of the Lord around you. If you find somebody you hadn't said hi to yet, please take a minute and say hi to them that you're glad to see them in the house of the Lord tonight. And you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We're so good, so glad to be home. We've been away for a few days and Sister Burns had a setback this afternoon and unable to be here tonight. But I know God is able to help us. I'm still kind of trying to get out of grandpa mode I've been in grandpa mode a little bit, and so if I treat you like a grandchild tonight, you'll know. <laughs> but it is so good to be back in the presence of the Lord and to hear the great reports of those who prayed through to the Holy Ghost and were baptized in Jesus' name. And then for the saints of God to just be encouraged challenged. One of the roles of an evangelist is to challenge our faith. And logging on to the live streams, it seems that the evangelist was just right for the moment. Aren't you thankful for revival? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, I give you praise, God, for revival. And harvest went right along with it. And thank you for being a great church. I'm so thankful for our leadership. Uh, I know I got a text message that the evangelist kept calling brother and sister Davis, our assistant pastor. <laughs> He's our executive pastor. They're our executive pastor. There's a difference. We'll explain it sometime. Uh, but uh, no, there's not been a leadership change. <laughs> and but their leadership during this season of revival has been great. Of course, all of our ministry team, Brother Sister Sprouse, the Morgans, everybody that played a role in serving while we were gone, thank you. And just the beautiful presence of the Lord. I got a report, I've got to say this, and I may say it again. Uh, 
here uh, later in the sermon. I may mention it again. Go ahead and turn to 1 Kings chapter 20 while I'm visiting here. And Brother Davis, if you can get to my channel on this, I need the monitor. Oh, I can do it from here. Never mind. While I'm visiting with you for a moment, 1 Kings chapter 20. What was I saying? Yeah, I got word that one of our newest families at Cornerstone Tabernacle opted for Sunday night church over a birthday party. Isn't that great? I want to commend them publicly for making that consecration and the Lord is going to bless and, uh, and reward them for making such a decision. Praise God. Well, I feel his presence here. He's been so good to us. Gave us a safe trip. We left in eight inches of snow and 14 forecasted. And God gave us a safe trip all the way here. We're thankful for that. Praise God. I believe in miracles. And I feel a miracle here tonight. I feel like God has, has um, victory on his mind. I don't think he's approaching these end times with being defeated. I think he's got victory and triumph on his mind, on his throne. He's sitting there thinking. I just know he's sitting there thinking, I'm gonna come out victorious on this. And I've got a church that the gates of hell cannot prevail against. You're that church. I'm that church. Aren't you thankful to be a part of that church? <laughs> Hallelujah. And so thankful for the victorious uh, touch of God. And I'm going to try to minister from that, out of that theme. I you know, told you, thank you, Ministry of Music, for the wonderful job of leading us tonight into worship. I think I told you the last time that I visited with you on a Wednesday night, which was the 17th, that I would come back, try to come back to the subject of God has a battle plan. God has a battle plan. And in that message, I hinted at picking back up in Joshua chapter 10, but I'm going to shift. I'm going to keep that for a little bit later, and I'm going to shift to a more panoramic big picture view. I believe the people of God need to know right now that God is working a very long plan. You're not, you're not caught by arbitrary winds. The church is not caught up in currents that's just taking it along. But God has strategically and powerfully positioned his church in the end time to be everything he wants it to be. Praise God. I want to lift up your hope tonight and your faith that God is working a master plan. The master is working a master plan. Now, the text is going to look like it's isolated. 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 28. It's going to look like that it's exclusive to that moment. But I think God is going to give us a bigger picture view before we leave here in the next little while that he, this is sort of a glimpse of what he's got planned. And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, I'd like for you to pick up and read this with me aloud for, for the next few sentences. Are you ready? The Lord is God of the hills but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. With lifted hands, let's thank him for his word. My God, I thank you for that help right now, Lord. Hallelujah. 
Praise God. Our God is mighty. Our God is wonderful. Everybody said in Jesus' name, and you can be seated. I want to remind you from Exodus chapter 15 and verse 3 that our God, the Lord, is a man of war. I won't go through all the verses, but I want to remind you that God, our God, is mighty in battle. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. The ingredients of this verse, the components of this verse tell us, hint to us that the name of the Lord is the strategic component to victory. It is victorious because his name is the Lord. Now, we know that the revelation of the name of Jesus is abounding everywhere. I know we're live streaming. I don't know uh, all, I won't be able to say specifics, but there was someone in this service Sunday night, uh, Saturday night. There was a, a member, actually a pastor of a church that was here Sunday night, Saturday night. I'll get it right. Here Saturday night and Sunday, pastor of a church. And I believe God is stirring whole congregations to the revelation of the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. Hey, I feel the power of the Holy Ghost to tell somebody, your prayers are gonna be answered. And the victory is in the name of Jesus. We don't just baptize in the name of Jesus. We don't just pray for the sick in the name of Jesus. Everything we do in word or in deed, we do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. One of our elders quotes this verse a lot. I hear him walking and praying this verse. For the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous run therein at and are safe. Let me tell you where the pavilion's gonna be in the end time. It's gonna be in the name of Jesus. The Lord is his name. He's a man of war. This is why David, when he became a man of war, I think I mentioned this in the last lesson, David became a man of war when he said, you come to me with spear, with sword, but I come to you in the name, <laughs> my God, I could run the aisles if I had strength. Run, uh, he started running toward him and said, I come to you in the name of the Lord. It was not that rock. That pebble, I don't care how fast it was going. That 17 year old boy couldn't release it fast enough to knock a giant down. God was waiting on that rock to hit his forehead and God smacked him in the back of the head. <laughs> Because the Bible says he fell down flat on his face. You don't get hit in a rock with propulsion and the laws of science. Get hit in a rock in the forehead and fall forward. Somebody look it up. 17 1 Samuel. It's there. He fell flat on his face. And it was not that rock, that stone. It was the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Somebody lift up the name of Jesus right now. How about at Cornerstone Tabernacle on campus, online, everybody lift up the name of Jesus with me right now. Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And there's great victory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to introduce this verse to you, Revelation 12 and 12. And I want to uh, be used of God to plant this, replant, fertilize, water, whatever it is, for your heart. You need to know your adversary's plan. He's got a battle plan. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Now, this is prophetic language. It's the book of Revelation. We know this that we, although we walk in the flesh, we do not walk after the flesh. We know that Jesus Christ has raised us up 
and made us sit together in heavenly places. If we're living only under the sun and we're not living in the, the spiritual places God has prepared, there's a good chance we can't rejoice. But if we get to walk it in the spirit, if we get to living by the word and spirit of God, there is a cause to rejoice. Oh, we know the devil's upset. He's mad. He's got great wrath. But we are rejoicing while he is getting mad. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and sea, for the devil is come down to you, having great wrath because, here's the point, he knows his time is short. Please get this. It's a part of the battle plan. God has us on timelessness, and he's got our adversary on a time clock. Don't worry, be not anxious, be anxious for nothing. <laughs> don't get upset when things don't go the way that we want them to go. Our adversary is on a time clock. He knows, he knows his time because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. God help the church know what time it is. If my adversary can get an advantage, it will be there in trying to fool us that we have all the time in the world or fearful that we have no time. I pastored a man that frequently, I'm gonna reverse that, often he would say, I'm gonna die. I just know I'm gonna die. Well, everybody's gonna die, brother. Quit talking that way. Say, I'm gonna live today. Quit thinking about the clock like that. But Lord, help me to understand redeeming the time for the days are evil. And it is high time, you know these verses? To awake out of sleep. Don't let me get sleepy spiritually. All right, there's a little vacuum right there in the spirit. Anybody uh, wanna stay awake in the end time? Let's just testify, great, let's just testify. I will not fall asleep in the harvest. I will not fall. I'm going to be awake and alert. I want to know what time it is. I want to uh, present to you tonight a principle and probably the only one we get to uh, finish up this second lesson with. On January 24th, that was a Sunday, I ministered. God has a battle plan on Wednesday the 17th and I felt so moved to follow up on Sunday the 24th with the victory of Jesus over the tempter. And I think I called it something about worship. Uh, why worship is the battlefield. That was it. Grab a Bible, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. I want to give you this principle because it's part of the big plan that both our adversary and Jesus Christ is working. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus is where? Talk to me. In the wilderness. Everybody say desert. desert. He's out there in the wilderness of Judea, very likely where John Bab the Baptist had been. There are some hills and uh, rises there, but predominantly it is wilderness. It is desert. Jesus then allows the adversary, Matthew chapter 4, verse 5, to take him from the desert, the wilderness, he takes him up. <clears throat> Everyone say up. up. Thank you. Up to the holy city. So it's from the wilderness up to the holy city. Set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And then in Matthew chapter 4 verse 8, Jesus ends up going from the wilderness to the pinnacle of the temple. And finally, way high to an exceeding high mountain. Do you see the progression? From the valley floor, from the valley, from the wilderness, progressively to the mountain. The adversary had it in his mind. I'm gonna to try to whip him in the valley, defeat him in the valley, 
if I can't get him on the valley, I'm going to take him up a little higher and try to defeat him there. And finally, he gets him up as high as he can take him. And Jesus comes off victorious in the valley and in the mountain. That's not just thrown in the Bible for us to uh, enjoy or get excited about that God can take us through the valleys. God can give us victory on the mountain. Praise God. Oh, I'm just going to say it again. We're victorious no matter the geography. <clears throat> oh, I want to shout it right now. Wherever you are in life, wherever, whatever you're going through in life, Jesus Christ has already won the battle right there where you are. If you're just beginning or if you're in midlife or if you're on the zenith of your life cycle, God, he's already become victorious over every tempter and every temptation. So now uh, he's victorious, he comes out victorious, and then finally the enemy leaves him for a season. The change in elevation was a revelation of the tempter's battle plan. I'm gonna try it in the wilderness, down there where they're low, and I'm gonna keep working until every season of their life is tempted is tested. If he doesn't win in the valley, your adversary is going to try his best to defeat you in the mountain. It is Luke 15. I didn't give this to you, but it's springing in on me. Let, let's just quickly cover it. Luke 15 is three lost things. First of all is the lost sheep. Does anybody remember where it was lost? in the mountain. The second was a lost silver. We say coin, it's lost silver. Where was it lost? In the house. Then finally, the lost son. Where did he end up? In the pig pen. See this progression. See this elevation change. Starts out in the mountain, then in the house, then in the pig pen of life. Get that down in your spirit. I'm going to be victorious no matter where I am. My God. Oh, let's shout hallelujah or something. Hallelujah or something that'll give God praise. Oh God, I'm just going to keep on being victorious. Hallelujah. That's a, an important thing principle to the battle plan because the enemy, he wants to do uh, his work wherever you are vulnerable. And he's going to try to find out where we are vulnerable. All right. So now let's get to our text tonight. Come with me to 1 Kings chapter 20. And I want to walk through this for a moment with you. In 1 Kings chapter 20, in verse number one, the king of Syria, his name is Ben Hadad. We say Benadad, but it's Ben Hadad, son of Hadad. Ben Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all the hosts together. I sent out an email hoping that everybody got it and was able to read at least some of these things. And there were 32 chariots. Well, we're given details, aren't we? The Syrian king sent to Ahab. Everybody shout, wicked king. Wicked. Yeah, Ahab was not a good fella. Bad fella. And his companion didn't help him a bit. And these were about to surrender the nation to the Syrian king. And he, the Syrian king begins to fight them. And there came to pass that the king of Syria decided that he was going to come up to battle and defeat the people of God. He battled them in the valley, in the mountains rather, in the mountains of northern Israel. Now, the slide, Sister Kumar, I'm going to have them here in a little bit in another part, but I'll show them to you in a moment. He comes in and he 
uh, he starts to fight them and they lose. The king of Syria loses. Ahab gets victory. And a messenger came and convinced, convinced the Syrian king, hey, their God is only powerful in the mountains. Did you see that? When you read through, their God, he's only powerful in the mountains. If you decide to have a fight with them, you got to fight them in the valley. And so in verse 28, which is our text, 2028, the man of God came right before the second battle and said to the king of Israel, Ahab, thus saith the Lord, the Syrians, oh God, have said, the Lord is God of the hills, the, va- the mountains. He is not the God of the valleys. Oh, hallelujah. Ahab, I just want you to know, the king of Syria has already convinced his, his army and confederates that they need to fight you in the valleys because that's where they're going to win and defeat you. But God said, here's what I'm going to do. Because they have said, I am limited to the hills only, I will deliver all the great multitude into thy hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. God got a little irate. We're going to see if I'm God of the mountains only. We're going to see if the hills are my only domain. I'm getting ready to show you, King of Syria, that I can whip up on you in the valley too. My God in heaven. And this this concept, it spans uh, the plan of the adversary. He's trying his best to get the people out of place, to fight them and to defeat them in places that... Uh, reflect the valley and reflect the mountain. Now, I want to take this, the rest of the time I have, I want to spin this because it's, this is a little bitty picture, a glimpse of the bigger plan that God is working. Let me show it to you. Now, I sent the email encouraging you to look at two chapters in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 38 and Ezekiel 39. I think that first slide, Sister uh, we'll, I don't know if I labeled them or not, but this, this is close. Maybe you can see it from there. <clears throat> um, when you read through those chapters, these are the names. Let's come back one. I'll get to that in just a second. Go ahead and grab. These are the names that you're going to see. You're going to read the word Persia, which is modern day Iran. You're going to read uh, Cush and Dedan and Gomer and Magog. And you're going to talk about uh, Put, P-H-U-T. Libya, you'll read that. Ethiopia, those names have not changed. Some of the names of these nations have changed. God in Ezekiel 38 and 39 prophesies to the nation through the mouth of the prophet Ezekiel that there is a war coming, he said. And I will put a hook in the jaw of these nations and I'm going to bring them to the mountains of northern Israel. Now let's go to uh, the next slide, that one you had just a moment ago. Here's the hook in the jaw. He's going to bring Rosh. Everybody say Russia. Russia. Magog, Meshach, Togomara, Gomer, Tubal. This is parts of Turkey. These are are, um, ethnic groups within these nations. Put, which is actually in Morocco, Ethiopia. He's going to bring these nations together and he's going to bring them to right just south of Lebanon to the northern mountains of Israel. And God says in these two chapters, there's no nation going to come to your aid. They're going to know that I am the Lord. Now, those of you who are monitoring prophecy tickers and things, this is the next big tick on the clock. When this war happens, oh God, 
it will precede the next war that I'm going to tell you about. But when Ezekiel 38 and 39, when that war happens and things are heating up for it to happen, when it happens, we, the people of God, will know it's very close. The coming of the Lord is very close. Don't let anybody tell you the day or the hour. Don't work that way. But we do know the times and the seasons. So these nations, Assyria has already been working with Russia. Syria has been working with Russia a long time. Uh, we're waiting for Libya and Put, which is Morocco. Those nations have yet to join in with this with this anti-Semitic move uh, against uh, Israel, uh, but even the United States of America. Now I'm gonna speculate, and lots of prophecy is that. I'm gonna speculate, don't take this as truth, I just want you to be aware of the possibility. A lot of us are wondering why didn't conservative, pro-Israel leadership be elected? This war excludes America. Things are being set up for this to happen. My God. So this is the battle of Gog and Magog. This is the war of Gog and Magog coming together in the northern, everybody shout mountains. The mountains or the hills of Jerusalem. Right up north of Jerusalem, uh, the hills and mountains of northern Israel. When that battle happens, church, know that it is coming time for the Lord Jesus Christ to return. In that time period between that war and the last and final war, it is called the War of Armageddon. You've heard about that one, haven't you? Revelation 16 and 16. Look at this verse with me. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Zechariah talks about this, but he pinpoints the geography. Zechariah 14 and 2. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem for battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, the women ravished, and the half of the city shall go forth into captivity. And the residue of the people shall not be cut off, shall be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. In the Gog Magog war, he said, I'm going to do it by myself. There'll be no help from anywhere else. And fight against those nations which he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand, verse 4, in that day upon the mount of olives, which is before Jerusalem to the east. This battle is not being fought in the mountains of northern Israel. This is being fat, fought in Jerusalem. And he says, on the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east, toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley. Half of the mountain shall move to the north, half of it shall move to the south, and ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azale. Yea, ye shall flee like as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and the Lord shall come, read the rest with me, and all the saints with him. The church is coming back with him in that battle. Gog and Magog, he's by himself doing it. Zechariah 12 and 11, my God. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem and the mourning of Hadad Ramon in the valley of Megiddon. God says in the end, I'm gonna fight first in the northern mountains of Israel and I'm gonna whip them in the mountains. Then I'm going to get my army, the church, and I'm going to become king of kings in the final valley, in the final battle, and I'm not going to whip them in the mountains. I'm going to whip them in the valley. I've come to tell you tonight, God has got a battle plan. He is working. The adversary strategy is to do exactly like God is doing.
He's masquerading as God. He mimics God's plans. Now I want to teach you and, and encourage you right now. Valleys mean spiritual low times to us. Mountains to us usually means a spiritual high time. I think I saw Alex Steen back there tonight as he go, Alex, Alex received the baptism of the Holy Ghost this past weekend. <laughs> Daniel called me. Daniel called. We talked uh, on the way home from Virginia. He, we talked and he said, I, I want you to know Alex got the Holy Ghost. He said all day long, every time I think about it, I've just been weeping and, and emotional about what God is doing. Hallelujah. I said, Brother Daniel, have you prayed through yet? He said, I haven't in a long time. I'm just believing tonight right here in the middle of teaching about Armageddon. God can baptize us. Somebody, God can renew us. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to be ready when Jesus comes. And the adversary, so right now the Steen family's riding a high mountain. He may call me next week and say, It's not so good right now. It's not, it's not so good right now. And then the next few weeks later, hey, we're back on the mountain. You know what I'm talking about, church. Is that the way life works? But I want to know, you to know tonight, God's working a battle plan. And whether if it's in your individual walk with God, it's still about the hills and the valleys. It's still about the mountains and the valleys. Don't get to thinking I'm down in the valley and God can't win here or I'm up on the mountain and I'm, I'm just doing just good and I've got it. No, you still need God. You need him on the mountain. You may need him on the mountain more than you need him in the valley. Because the valley will tell you, you need, you've got a need and you need help. But sometimes on the mountain, we think we got it all together. <laughs> Are you healthy? Thank God for it and surrender. Are you sick? Just thank God for the healing power in the name of Jesus. Is your bank account broke? Why don't you have yourself a praise break? But if you've got a lot of money in the bank, praise him anyhow. Man, I feel a praise break coming right now because worship is still the battlefield. Come on, let's praise him together. I invite you to worship the Lord. Hallelujah. God's got a battle plan and so does the church of the living God. We're gonna come out victorious. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords and Jesus is his name. Hallelujah, Jesus is his name. Let's worship him right now. Oh, magnify the Lord. He's God of the mountain. He's still God in the valley. And he's going to help us. The geography doesn't change our faith. If it does, we're still growing. Don't get under a guilt trip or a pity party because you get caught in the valley and you fall apart. Don't, don't do that. It's unproductive. It doesn't help you at all. If you fall apart, get a prayer partner. Get, if you fall apart, get somebody to beside you to help you up. Two's better than one. Listen, if you fall, you need somebody to help you. I'm just telling you, the devil's plan is to isolate you. Get you all by yourself and then say you're defeated. But if I can get help from you, help from one another, help from the Lord. Hallelujah, my God, I feel his power. See, that's a battle plan. But nobody understands. Nobody comes to my aid. Then have you a praise break all by yourself. I'm not telling you theory. I'm telling you real life shoe leather experience. Oh, I've got them rolling through my head right now. Times when the, the wilderness test. I want him to test me in that mountain. <laughs> Or maybe not. Lord, whatever you want, God. <laughs> I just believe his power is sustaining. His grace is sufficient. Oh, 
in weakness we're made strong. Hallelujah. Man, there's a move of the Holy Ghost here, church family. God wants to strengthen us in the end time. We're not gonna fall. God's got a battle plan. The enemy's test and his attacks come when we are unusually low or unusually high. Now those just coming to the Lord, I don't mean high on drugs. Okay? <laughs> I'm tempted to tell you a story that happened a couple weeks ago, but I, I better not. So, <laughs> inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> You know, revival in a great house. Where's that? Simon Peter. In a great house, there are vessels of honor, dishonor. There's gold, golden vessels, silver, wood, hay, and st there's, there's all kinds of in a great house. Look at there. Aren't they awesome? That's Timothy. That's not, that's Paul, not Peter. Let's read it. One, two, three. But in a great house. They're not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth. Some to honor, some to dishonor. See, this is a great house. We got all kinds of people at all kinds of places of growth. We got folks that have been here since Noah. Now over in Tennessee, they say pretty near. I don't know if they say it over here. I haven't ever heard anybody say it over here, but that means real close. And then we've got others that are just starting their walk with God. Sister Candy, we're so, so proud of you. How long you been clean? Add it up. Shout it whenever you get it, okay? Think it. Get, I want the truth, so tell me. How long you been clean? Brother Nate, three months and counting. Huh? Three and a half. <laughs> Let me tell you, the adversary will catch him on a low day. And that nicotine devil, y'all don't know what I'm talking about. I'm glad most of you don't. But that thing will come, you'll, oh my God, what? I'm weakening. No, greater is he that is in me. How long? One year, nine months clean. Oh God. Hallelujah. Is great. Oh, my God is great. Church, you don't know what that means, but I'm telling you, that's beautiful. God's sustaining power, the power of the Holy Ghost. Devil, you're not going to win. God's got a battle plan, and we're going to come out victorious. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Leave the battle and the victory. Leave all that in God's hands. What is my human responsibility in the spiritual warfare that is taking place in the end time? This is key and critical. And I'm gonna wrap up the lesson. What is the human responsibility? What is my responsibility in this spiritual warfare in the end time? I think it's two words. Keep believing. There are going to be times when it looks like that system, they're going to win. It, it may appear for a little time that the cross was the end of the story. But it was really only the beginning of his story. My God. Whew, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful that God keeps on authoring and finishing our faith? Amen. Don't cave in. Now, <clears throat> there's going to be uh, occasion when setbacks will happen. Somebody preached it that it's really for the child of God. A setback is a setup. Remember that, Brother Job, whoever Brother Job or Sister Job is here tonight. Remember that when it looks like you're going to lose everything. And you may, we may. But there's going to be a double portion at the end. That's right. That's right. If I will keep believing. Fight for your faith. 
Man, I feel that for somebody online, right? Fight for your faith. Keep believing God. In, in every, uh, you know, what was old Abraham? Uh, we had a little Bible study before church, Brother Sister Weaver and I, and we got into Abraham a little bit. And the Bible says, I think it was Romans 4. Of course, that's me just thinking. But it says he wavered, he staggered not. The hint in that is the enormity of the promise. God promised him that all the families of the earth would be blessed in him. That is huge. That mild single life is going to touch every family. That all the families of the earth would be blessed in Abraham. This man staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. All right, so I've got to talk about this for a minute. I said I was closing though, didn't I? Let me talk. Got a few more minutes? Give me just a few more minutes. So let me tell you what unbelief is. Unbelief is the strongest or deepest or highest, depending on which way you're going, level of lack of confidence in God. Unbelief is not just doubting. It is a refusal to believe. Faith wants to believe. Unbelief is the reversal of that. And unbelief is a, is a deal. It's God, in fact, it is said of Jesus Christ, he went into one town and he couldn't do no, no mighty miracles there because of their unbelief. They just refused. You're Mary's kid. That's all you'll ever be is Mary's kid. And they refused to believe, a refusal. Now, there was a blindness, and there's a bigger picture, but, but he, Abraham's body was dead. Hebrews 11, 17, was that right? Hebrews eleven seventeen, 17, his body was dead, and his companion's body was biologically, they both were unable to conceive and have children. And they had already, verse 18, gotten Isaac, received him in a figure from their dead bodies when he was told to go offer up Isaac. And in Romans 4, he said, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Don't think for a moment his faith wasn't tested and he, oh, is this ever gonna happen? God knows we're gonna question what did Jesus say on the cross? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Don't demand an answer. It's okay to ask the question because you're going to feel at times. Just don't demand the answer. But what was Abraham? Abraham was not going to, not just disbelief or doubt. He said, I'm going to be strong in Faith, Romans 4, strong in faith. And that's where we're going, church. We're not going to barely make it. I know it's quiet right now. I, I wanted to seek in. You're not going to barely make it. Here is the faith and patience of the saints. We're going to have to be patient, full of faith, and trust his battle plan. And I wanted you to know tonight where the battle is going to be. It's going to be in the mountains. It's going to be in the valleys. Those extremes is where the adversary and the Lord Jesus Christ are going to come off victorious. Now, what do I do when my faith is tested? Giving glory to God. I don't know how it's going to come out, but I worship you because you know how it's going to come out. Lord, I don't know how this is going to happen. The government's promised this. The government's promised that. Oh, God. Come on, church. I think, I really believe we see through it. But if you don't, you better get your eyes off of that and get our eyes on Jesus. I know it's simple, but it's the, the way we're going to be strong in faith. Let's stand to our feet and give God thanks right now.
We don't need any music. I just want us to worship the Lord here a moment. I've got another verse or two, but let's just praise God. Fight for your faith right now. Fight for your faith. Make it simple. Oh God, I'm just gonna keep on fighting for my faith. My confidence will not waver. And if it does, I'm gonna surround myself with people who can help me fight the fight of faith. I'm not gonna get isolated. My God, there's utterance here right now. I'm not gonna get abandoned and isolated and off by myself. Oh God, I'm gonna keep on reaching for you. Oh Cornerstone Tabernacle, you are awesome. You are awesome. God has his hand on this congregation, doesn't he? Are we people of faith? I'm trying to see the whites of your eyeballs. Are we people of faith? We're going to switch gears. And I'm going to uh, preach this coming Sunday, if the Lord continues to lead me, about the forgotten latter rain, a blessing of the lat- what God is going to do in the end. There, there's something we've forgotten. He's going to pour it out. And I believe Sunday, be here Sunday, that God is going to revive and rekindle a promise to this church. I don't know who made the promise, but I feel like it's laying there and it needs to be breathed upon. Whew. And when God revives that promise, oh, hallelujah, there's going to be a great revolution, a great revelation and a revolution in this congregation. Hallelujah. We're not going down. We're not diminishing. This thing is going up. This thing is increasing. Hallelujah. So what, what is my human responsibility? I got to get that planted. What is my human responsibility? Keep I heard somebody say it, keep believing. When it looks like it's unbelievable, keep believing. God is working a work. Now we're gonna finish with 2 Corinthians 2 and 14. I'm gonna read it in the King James and the Amplified. We're gonna read it together and then we'll go get a rallies. (laughs) Somebody get ready to invite me to rallies tonight, okay? I'm just being serious. <laughs> Second Corinthians 2.14. Are you ready? In the back, are you ready? One, two, three. Now, thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Wow. Now, Amplified Bible. Here we go. One, two, three. But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumph as trophies of Christ's victory and through us spreads and make evidence the fragrance of the knowledge of God everywhere. Hallelujah. What are we going to do in the end time? We're going to keep spreading an aroma of faith, an aroma of grace, an aroma of love everywhere we go. You're different. Quit trying to fit in. Don't talk that fear. Don't believe that fear. Somebody say, God, I'm going to spread the knowledge of God. Leave here tonight. Oh, I want you to leave here tonight knowing he's God of the mountains. (laughs) And he is God in the valleys. So wherever you are, what are you going to do? Oh, I just felt that pastor come on me. (laughs) I can't shake it off either. I'm trying to shake that pastor off of me. But here he comes. Don't you get to murmuring and complaining. Did you hear the pastor a little bit? So here comes the evangelist again. What are we going to do? Keep believing. We're going to speak what we see. I have believed, therefore have I spoken. What's coming out of my mouth, it's not just It's not just pie in the sky or say it and you can have it. This is about a confidence that God, it is bad. I'm not saying it isn't bad. 
I'm not say, I've never said that this Corona thing was a, a false or that this thing is real. It's as real as any other uh, human condition. But I'm telling you, God is more powerful than this. That's what I'm going to spread. Doesn't mean I ignore the result. That, but I'm just going to say, God can do it. God can do it. Come on, let's praise him. Let's praise him as we leave tonight. God's got a battle plan. Shout it. Shout it, shout it, shout it, shout it. Tell it everywhere you go. Oh, God, my, 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 God's got a battle plan. All right, just, uh, do y'all know, do y'all know that bless your heart thing that they do in the South? Pra practice on somebody right that's moping right there beside you. Pat them on, bless your heart. <laughs> now tell them, leave that verse up there. Tell them, you look like a trophy. <laughs> Sister Burns, you, you're a trophy wife. <laughs> Man, I had a few days off. All right, tell somebody there's a battle plan and you can leave. God bless you. We'll see you Sunday. Come expecting, okay? Come expecting Sunday. God has a battle plan. Did you get it? Tell somebody, I got it. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. I love you, Cornerstone. You're awesome. Great things are happening everywhere.